Hello everyone, Nyx here. Welcome to my new gaming channel. I decided to make a channel for everything RPGs, story-based games, just basically all the games that I like to play. So welcome to this playthrough of Pillars of Eternity. In this video today, we will just be going through the character creation menu. Um, I have played the game before, but this game has like infinite replayability, so I'm really excited to start the game completely new class, new race, new everything, just to see how it changes. So let's get into the game and see what kind of character we can create. And go ahead and click new game. So there are different um, difficulty settings as you can see. I was playing the game on easy before just to kind of, you know, get used to the game. Um, it's been a long time since I've played games like this. I think Dragon Age Origins is really the only other game that I've played that is similar sort of CRPG game based on, you know, D&D rules and things like that. It can get a little bit complicated, um, but I basically fell in love with this game and I'm really excited to play more games like this. It makes me want to go back and play like Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights and everything. So I'm going to go ahead and put it on normal for this playthrough. <laughs> Let's see if I can handle it. There might be a lot of wipes. It might be entertaining. We'll see how it goes. Okay, we will click accept. Love Obsidian. They're like literally my top three game studios, along with Bioware and Bethesda. Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a starless night. Their master glancing ever upward to the skies for assurance that he is on the right course. A dim lantern, his only protection against the encroaching darkness. But the skies bring no comfort, shining no light, betraying no hint of what they know. The caravan carries travelers bound for the frontier hamlet of Gilded Vale, you among them, where a local lord has offered land and wealth to settlers from abroad looking for a fresh start. You have taken suddenly ill, sweating and shivering, and one of the other travelers signals for the caravan master to stop on your behalf. He pulls up just in time to avoid plowing into the trunk of a fallen tree that bars the way ahead. You will go no further tonight. All right, who are we going to be this time? Um, so I usually play female characters, not always, but I usually do, especially in these types of games where, you know, a lot of games they just don't even give you the option. You're always going to have to play like the heroic white guy or whatever, so <laughs> it's exciting to play a lot of story-based games, RPGs that give you the choice. So I am going to play a woman, and if you want to read any of these, um, you know, like the background and everything, just feel free to pause the video and read them, but I'm going to keep going. So this is where it gets interesting. Last time I played an elf. Oh, and for each of these races, they have like sub races that you can choose. So I will go ahead and just briefly look at each race and show you the different options that you can pick. And while I'm doing that, I have to think to myself, what do I want to play this time? Probably not another elf. I did elf before. Elves always tend to be like my favorite type of race in RPGs. I don't know why. I'm an elf fangirl. This is probably one of the coolest races. You can be a godlike. And they're pretty weird. They're basically like touched by the gods or favored by the gods. Some such. Um, but yeah, so let's see. And also each race gives you, you know, a boost to your stats. I'm probably not going to be human because they're pretty boring. You can be a human in pretty much everything. So the Almawa, it's hard to say, but I think I'm saying it right. Almawa. <laughs> they're kind of like a giant race and they live by the oceans. So I don't know. I don't really want to be an Almawa. I think I'm probably going to go with a godlike. 
because they're interesting like you can choose different god likes and you know which god they favor i think maybe but yeah i think i'm gonna go with the god like they've been blessed with physical aspects associated with the gods so they get plus one to dexterity and a plus one to intellect and you can choose four different types of godlikes. Let's see what they've got. A, ooh. Okay, that just looks weird. <laughs> a death godlike? Like, what is going on with her face there? It looks like a walnut or an acorn or something. I have no idea. They're the most distrusted of their kind. Oh, uh, yeah, I can see why. They have strange growths covering their eyes. Oh. Oh, and each subtype can have, like, a special ability that they can use once per, I think it's once per encounter or once per fight. Well, it's kind of cool, like, if they attack someone that has 25% or less endurance, their damage is increased. But, I don't know, looks kind of too weird. Fire godlike, that's pretty cool. Let's see what their ability is. When they have less than 50% endurance, fire, godlike, glow like metal, and a forge, their damage reduction, uh, gaining damage reduction, and doing a small amount of fire damage to any creature who hits them in melee. That's pretty cool. Uh, and the dead fire archipelago. With the power to awaken volcanoes. That's pretty cool. I don't really like Mogren though. <laughs> uh, you probably will see why during this playthrough, but she's probably one of my least favorite of the gods and goddesses in Eora. So I don't know if I'm really gonna choose a fire godlike. Moon godlike looks really cool, or maybe a nature godlike. Well, these ones are the most tolerated, apparently. A large moonlight growth. Oh, that's true. They have like kind of like a halo thing going on. Ooh, propensity to bring luck. That's pretty neat. Moon godlike like, generate waves of healing moonlight that restore endurance to them and their allies. Well, that is a neat ability. Not gonna lie. And then a nature godlike. Human and animal features. Ooh, stigma that they're diseased. Well, that's terrible. All spring of life grants a bonus when endurance is below 50%. I think I'm going to either go with a nature or a moon godlike. I think I'll go with a moon godlike. They're pretty cool. Oh, but just, just to show you guys, like this is what all the different types of races look like. In case you were curious. Dwarves can be mountain or boreal. Elves can be basic wood elf or pale elf. I did a pale elf before. Orlins are kind of like hobbity creatures. You can be hearth or wild orlin. Wild orlins are actually pretty cool looking. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with my moon godlike. So the next thing you get to choose is the body type, which I don't remember this before. Oh, oh, okay, because it's because you're playing a godlike. So you can be like, you could basically get like a sub race of godlike, I guess. So that's kind of cool. Let's see here what they all def they look like. <laughs> could be an elven godlike, an orlin godlike. Well, I did an elf before, but I just really like elves, so I think maybe I'll do an elven godlike. <laughs> Aha, this is where you choose your class. Last time I chose Chanter, which is a pretty unique type of class to this game. I don't think I really ever played another game that had a class like Chanter. They basically um, speak chants, and the chants give, like, uh, they're made up of magical phrases and they produce passive effects and when you've chanted so many like chants or whatever then you get to do 
like pretty powerful spells so it's pretty cool also your class will also give you bonuses to your stats certain stats it's not going to do chantrigan obviously um but there are like fighter type classes barbarian fighter and paladin are kind of like the traditional fighter melee type classes although they don't have to be melee like the cool thing about pillars of eternity is that basically anyone can wield or wear anything so it doesn't really matter what class you are you can give anyone like whatever type of weapons or armor you want so but you definitely have certain abilities and kind of like a certain play style with each class so it just kind of depends what you want to do so they're also cypher is a pretty cool class um this is another like unique one they're kind of like a mind dominating type class they charm or dominate a lot of enemies to get them to fight for you so i think that's a pretty cool class druids can kind of turn into like were creatures so like they'll turn into like a bear or a wolf or something but like not like the full animal it looks like a were bear or like a werewolf or something monk is kind of your pretty much standard like unarmed fighting class priests are pretty much like a standard healing type class rangers i like rangers they get animal companions to fight for them a rogue pretty you know basic like thief or rogue type class and then of course you've got your wizards which i love being a mage in most games i love spells i love being a magic class so i'm kind of drawn to classes like that so i might decide to be a wizard but i'm sort of drawn to being maybe a cypher or even a druid we'll have to see let's look at each class more in depth they were once called Brishalguin. I'm really terrible at pronouncing a lot of the, the names and phrases in this game, so <laughs> apologies in advance. Bind Hunters by the Glen Fathoms. They have the ability to directly contact and manipulate another person's soul and psyche using an ally's or enemy's essence as the focus for their magic. The most ciphers are still found in the Eastern Reach. Practitioners of the techniques have spread throughout the known world. They are gaining acceptance over time, but are generally distrusted, especially by the uneducated. Yeah, because they basically will dominate your mind. <laughs> but I think it's a pretty cool, pretty cool class. So they start with a bonus to stealth, lore, and mechanics. They have low endurance, low health. Basically, they're they're squishy. <laughs> average accuracy and deflection let's look at druids and wizards or maybe even a paladin because i mean she as a moon god like has sort of like a special healing ability and paladins are like fighters but also healers so let's look at paladin in any culture where a fanatical group of like-minded individuals have formed a warrior society blah 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 they hold leadership positions in armies. It, it would be kind of funny if I end up making a paladin godlike because um, you'll find out later. But there's another paladin godlike in the game, so I'm not quite sure if I want to do that. But I mean, it doesn't really matter. We would just probably wouldn't put her in our party a whole lot because I'd be like basically the same as her. Starting ability, faith and conviction. Paladins have an inherent bonus to all of their defenses. That's pretty nice. For the course of the game, the value of this bonus may shift based on the reputation the paladin gains relative to the behaviors that are preferred by his or her order. That is interesting. That's a pretty interesting mechanic. I didn't realize that. They gain plus two to mechanics and one to lore. Pretty average starting stats. High health and endurance, which is nice. And then you've got your basic wizard, which is definitely like a glass cannon. They do a lot of damage in this game, but they're very squishy. Um, so I might choose to be a wizard. Not going to lie, I love playing with spells and everything. So let's just see. <laughs> they become known for their eccentricity, their egos, and their unquenchable interest in all things arcane and occult. Yeah, wizards do tend to be kind of like know-it-alls, but I mean... 
It's kind of deserved. They spent all this time studying magic and everything. Arcane Assault. Access to a variety of spells. So in this game, magic, you don't just like learn the spell and then know it forever. You basically will use spells out of grimoires. Um, kind of like, I think there's a class in D&D that's the same thing where you have to like use a book to, they learn their spells from books basically. So this is very similar to that. I can only hold four spells of each spell level, which motivates wizards to keep multiple grimoires for different needs. So you can switch between different grimoires depending on, you know, what you want to do in a fight, which is pretty useful. And every couple of levels, wizards gain access to an additional set of spells. They can automatically learn one spell of any level they can access each time they advance. They also have the option of learning spells from grimoires they find or buy. Initially, their spells can be cast a limited number of times per rest. So a per rest ability can only be used for a set number of times before running out of uses. So it's every time, so you can do, I guess what would be called like a long rest in like D&D or similar games. And resting is the only way you can actually regain your health in the game, aside from like two abilities. Um, so this would be an ability you can only do for a certain amount of times between resting. So you actually do want to rest a lot in the game to recover your health and gain these abilities back. As wizards gain power, their weaker spells eventually shift to per encounter use, which is really nice. Like you want to be able to use these spells more often, not just every rest. So they gain two to lore, one to mechanics. Mechanics lets you like find hidden objects and unlock locks and things like that. It's a pretty good mechanic to have, but also like you don't have to take every single skill depending on who's in your party. You can have someone else that has a high level of mechanics and they can you know deal with that <laughs> so yeah see how they start out low to like all of these stats because they're basically just like glass cannons they're so squishy but they do a lot of damage so it just depends how you want to play i think i am going to go maybe with a paladin i mean as a chanter a chanter is what i play before similar enough it's like definitely a magic class similar enough to wizard that i think i kind of go want to go with something that's a lot different and paladin can still cast spells and abilities but they also are fighters definitely so i think i'm gonna go with the paladin what i really like about this game though is that you can choose so many options about your character's background and story there's so many different options and ways that you can role play in the game i mean just look at this so now that i picked paladin i can choose you know which order of paladins that i come from and you can there's just so many options so i'm gonna go ahead and read through some of these options to decide you know which order i want to be a part of so the Bleak Walkers are soldiers dedicated to conducting warfare mercilessly and with extreme brutality in order to bring a swift end to conflicts. Because they are renowned for their terrible and unyielding nature, most nobles will only call on them as a last resort. The Bleak Walkers' behavior reinforces cruelty because the quickest resolution to a battle is one in which the Bleak Walkers' arrival is announced and a surrender immediately follows. To ensure that people understand that no mercy will be given by bleak walkers, they never give quarter under any circumstances. Favor dispositions, cruel, aggressive. Disfavor dispositions, benevolent, diplomatic. It can be fun to play like this sort of asshole, like renegade type character, but <laughs> I don't think that's what I want to do for this playthrough and then and this let's play, but you know, maybe in the future I'll do something like that. So I don't think I'm gonna be a bleak walker. Dark cozy paladini. The oldest known paladin order in the world, the Darkozy Paladini, were founded as the guards of the Darkozy Palace in Granvalia over 2,000 years ago. Since the shattering of Granvalia, the Darkozy Paladini have transformed into the protectors and ambassadors of the immense Darkozy family, as well as old Valian culture. The Dargozi Paladini are widespread and occasionally even come into conflict with each other due to the machinations of the Darkozy family. Paladins of the Order are renowned for their wit and love of life. 
Well, that sounds pretty neat. So favored, passionate and clever, disfavored, cool and stoic. So maybe we'll come back to them. Gold pack knights. The gold pack knights are an order of mercenary paladins who sell themselves for all sorts of defensive and offensive engagements. They emerged on the Pearl Coast a few hundred years ago and managed to survive the destruction of the dwarven nation that created them. Gold packed knights are not especially brutal and are willing to shift direction based on the desires of their employers. As their name suggests, the gold pack knights believe payment forms a binding contract. They are known for being non-judgmental, professional, and impressively mirthless. So stoic, rational, disfavored, passionate, and aggressive. Hmm, maybe. Kind Wayfarers. The most widespread paladin order, the Kind Wayfarers, are guides and protectors for travelers, often people of limited means traveling in dangerous areas. Kind wayfarers lack the noble prestige of other orders, but are widely respected by commoners for their generosity and compassion. Kind wayfarers lack a centralized structure and many members operate independently in remote areas. Though the order is known for not being wealthy, in recent years they've improved their finances via cartography and working with groups like the Hand Occult to develop travel guides for little known parts of Aora. So they're benevolent and passionate and they don't like being deceptive or cool. It's pretty nice. I mean, <laughs> they <laughs> the traditional do-gooders, so maybe. I feel like I'm kind of a softy at heart, so I'm drawn to that sort of like altruistic type playthrough with like a noble hero, so maybe. We'll, we might be a kind of wayfarer. Shield Bears of St. Elka. During a peace negotiation, an archer from the kingdom of Ad Ad Adir shot the noblewoman emissary of Colkin, Elka, in the arm, provoking battle. Elka nevertheless made a second attempt at negotiation, accompanied by three elven knights, whose only arms were shields they held in front of Elka to protect her. Elka succeeded helping to form the Adir Empire. The knights who protected her founded the Shield Bears of St. Elka, who continue to act as guardians and diplomats in Adir and beyond. They are well known for their honesty and skill in negotiations. So they like being known as honest and diplomatic. They don't like being cruel or aggressive. Honestly, I think I'm going to go with the kind wayfarers. I, I really like their description. They're just basically benevolent do-gooders that just want to help out the common folk. So let's do it. Paladin ability. So you get to select like a starting ability that you know right off the bat. They cover three major categories, close passive abilities, which are just, you know, on all the time, and modal support abilities. It's one that causes effects to occur continuously while it is active, so kind of like a sustained ability. For example, a paladin's zealous auras grant bonuses to everyone near, so they basically buff people. Modal abilities are often grouped so that only one modal ability in a category can be active at any given time, that makes sense. Groupings are reflected by how the abilities are organized on the action bar. And we'll see that later when we start the actual game. So, yes. Yeah, sustained support abilities, single target support, and a small number of targeted offensive abilities. So basically, I'm going to be buffing my party and keeping them alive and doing a little bit of damage. But basically, yeah, just I'm a buffing class, which is fine by me. Flames of Devotion calls upon the paladin's inner fire, causing their equipped weapons to burst into flame and adding burn damage to their next attack. You can use it two per fight. Instant. Oh, okay, interesting. So, okay, so it's accuracy versus deflection, plus 50% damage and burn, plus 20% accuracy, and we'll start to see a little bit more how these, like I said, CRPGs can be a little bit complicated. They re, re, uh, rely, a lot, rely a lot on D&D type rules and everything, so I don't pretend to be an expert at how it works, but I know just enough about how it works to hopefully not die all the time <laughs> during this let's play to hopefully be able to you know play the game and not wipe all the time having to have a good time playing so we'll see how it goes lay on hands fueled solely by belief the paladin is able to heal with the touch of his or her hands recovering a substantial amount of endurance for the paladin or an ally within range 
I think I'm going to go with Flames of Devotion. There is a character in the game that is just more straight up like a healer type character. So I think I'm going to go more with, you know, support and offensive abilities rather than doing most of the healing myself. Okay, here is where it gets interesting. <laughs> so, and you can see they put like a little star next to the attributes that they think are most important for your class. Um, with Resolve being highly recommended for the Paladin. So I'll just go over these briefly. But your Might stat. Um, and none of these stats are useless. Like in other games, like, you know, like Fallout or whatever, like with Special. That there's not like one stat that's completely useless like all of these stats are important to different degrees for each type of character so might basically is controls how much damage and healing you do and gives you a bonus to fortitude so fortitude uh, resists certain types of attacks like poison so might is going to be important for everyone depending on how much damage and healing you want to do so i'm definitely going to give myself some points into might also, once you select these, you can never change these attributes. You can acquire certain like items, amulets, rings, things like that. That might give you a bonus to certain attributes. But once you choose these, that's it. And also a lot of um, the conversation and choices you make in the game rely on your stats. Like if you don't have a high enough resolve or whatever, you're not going to be able to choose certain things or do certain things. And that's another reason why the game, I feel like, is infinitely replayable because you can't do every single thing or make every single choice during a single playthrough. And things change dramatically based on your race and your class and your cultural background and things like that. So for Might, I'm definitely going to raise up Might. And you can see how this is going to affect the stats as I increase increase the attribute so and i only get 15 points to play with so this might take me a little bit to decide fully what i want to do and constitution is kind of your basic like buff to health and endurance now there are two stats that are important in pillars of eternity health and endurance and we'll go more into that as we play the game but basically, you never want to get down to zero health <laughs> because you can die permanently in this game. Unlike a lot of games, you can die permanently. So it gets dramatic. But yes, yeah, so it's not used much in attractions, but it kind of determines like your damage or how much endurance that you'll have, like how much health you'll have. and your fortitude which resists again like the poisons or diseases probably not going to pour a lot into constitution maybe give myself two more might just because she's going to be kind of squishy she i mean she's not going to be all the way up there doing frontline damage all the time she doesn't have to stick with their sword and a shield like it shows you here like i could use a bow I can use like a quarter staff, I can use whatever I want basically. It just depends what I think is the best the best playthrough. So let's see, dexterity. I get a bonus to that for being godlike. But it increases how fast you can attack and your reflex. And a reflex is a defense that lets you dodge out of the way of area of effect attacks. So it's useful, but you know, I'm probably not gonna give myself a lot of it. Perception comes up a lot in different dialogues and choices, so I don't know, I might give myself some perception. Can you be used to catch someone in a lie to make an observant comment or to notice something happening in the background? So in combat, it buffs accuracy, and accuracy is how likely you are to, your attack is to affect the character. So if accuracy is above the target's defense, it's going to be more likely to result in a hit or a crit. So like you, like you would think. So how likely are you to land your hit? And how likely is it to be a critical hit? Contributes to the reflex, which we've already talked about. And grants a bonus to interrupt. So you're able to interrupt um, 
enemy's abilities and they can interrupt you and that just basically like delays how fast you can do certain attacks so they could interrupt like a spell or something and then you have to redo it so being able to interrupt people is useful or having a high concentration which we'll see later like prevents people from interrupting you so let's see i'm gonna definitely give myself some perception but then again i do want to have like a high, you know, like resolve. Resolve is used a lot in conversations and I do kind of want to have like a stat that I'm really good, like really high in. So I might go almost all in on resolve and intellect and just take a little bit away from stats like dexterity and, eh, and might because I mean, I'm not going to be like the primary damage dealer. So let's go with resolve get that up there to like 16 or something now you can see that uh, that increases my concentration which is my ability to not be interrupted basically deflection which you know resists strict melee and ranged attacks and will which is a type of defense that def uh, defends against mental based attacks and also it's used a lot in conversations and noticing things. It's useful for mental intimidation, leadership, and convincing performances. It makes sense that a paladin, a natural leader, would have a lot of resolve. I'm definitely going to give some to intellect because that will increase the area of effect of my spells and abilities. And also gives me a bonus to will, which again, I can resist certain attacks. But not like, maybe not a whole lot to intellect. But it is also used in interactions, and it's useful for deduction, sudden realizations, and problem solving. Hmm. Maybe I'll do intellect of 14, resolve of 16. I could still give myself a might of 14 again. I almost want to make this really high, though. I think there are certain instances in the game where you need, like, a high resolve to do certain things. It just depends. Where do I want to take another point from, though? Should I take it away from dexterity? I won't be super fast at, you know, using my spells or abilities, but... You know what I'm doing? I'm going to have a high resolve. Alright, that, that is going to be my stats. So next, you get to choose your culture. So there are a lot of different kingdoms and cultures within uh, Eora or Aora. I think they did a really good job creating a whole new world with, you know, different races and different kingdoms. And I'm really excited for the um, fully 3D, you know, uh, triple a version of the game that they're basically making with avowed um i've heard it like compared to skyrim but it's set in the world of pillars of eternity it's set in eora so basically picture this game but, like on the same level as skyrim so i'm really excited for that too so for culture she could basically be from anywhere she's an elven godlike that's an order of paladins that basically travel everywhere so basically i'm just picking like where is she from what is her home the Adir Empire is currently the largest and most powerful force in this part of the world. It is centered around the equator and has a tropical climate. Though the Empire has colonies in numerous areas of the world, Greater Adir is at its heart and houses the majority of its human and elven nations. And again, like they, they will give you bonuses to certain attributes. Deadfire, excuse me, Deadfire Archipelago, consisting of the nation of Nasatak, Dozens of Ao Maua settlements and hundreds of lawless pirate infested islands that stretch along the southern sea. Deadfire is home to boreal dwarves, Ao Maua, and a mixed variety of other races. Deadfire Archipelago is the last stop for anyone headed east. A multitude of monstrous sea creatures infest the ocean beyond, making travel virtually impossible. I never know how to say this. Um, there are some characters in the game that pronounce it different ways, but most of the time they pronounce it exomital. So located to the northeast of Erglon Foth, the exomital plains are a large expanse of fertile savannas that are extensively farmed by human and orland residents. 
The Exomital culture is one of the oldest in the world, though one of the least imperialistic, having spread out little over the past several thousand years. Old Valia. Once the crown jewel of the southern seas, Old Valia is now the crumbled remnants of an empire of warring merchant nations. Counting many humans and dwarves among their ranks, the Old Valian countries are still forces to be reckoned with and are proud of their rich cultural heritage. Rawatai. Dominated by the Aumawa nation of Rawatai, the gulf itself is host to a number of nations, most of them Aumawa, Orlin, and Dwarven. Though these countries are relatively young, they are some of the most advanced colonial settlements in the east. The gulf is a land of riches and resources for those who can take them, though the entire coast is often pummeled by violent storms. The Living Lands the living lands, oh, and <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but like depending on your cultural background, it changes your starting equipment and your armor, which I think is really neat. The living lands is the mountainous region of a large northern island renowned for its diversity of plant and animal life. And apparently this is also where Avowed is going to take place, so it's pretty cool. Um, its weather is unpredictable and its ecosystems vary dramatically from valley to valley. The living lands are home to an assortment of races and a variety of colonial and independent settlements. So that gives you a plus one to might. I've heard the living lands is kind of like a, uh, a lawless kind of place too. Like it's not as civilized as maybe some of the other regions. So the white that wins... A large, this is where my other character was from because she was a pale elf. A large cracked southern expanse of polar ice, the white that wends is home to pale elves and small colonies of daring ex explorers, outcasts, and adventurers. While virtually no plant life grows in the white, it is home to many hardy species of dangerous animals that forage from the sea or prey upon each other to survive. So I am torn between making her from Adir or the Living Lands. Now, because I'm excited for Avowed, and Avowed supposedly is going to take place in the Living Lands, I'm going to give her a cultural background as being from the Living Lands. And we're going to go next. Oh, and see, there's still there's still even more that you can give her. Okay, so like, what was she like before she was a paladin? Like, what does she do? Like, she's part of the Order of Paladins, but, you know, like, what is her goal or purpose in life, basically? And again, it gives you um, a bonus to abilities, that which we'll talk about more later. So, you were part of a group that founded a fledgling colony in a distant land. So, she could be a colonist. Um, my previous character was an explorer. You find the siren call of the horizon irresistible. You cannot help but wonder what lies beyond the next hill or wave, and you've built your life around finding out. Labor. Your life has been spent in the study of your craft. You trained and prepared, hoping to hone your skills and ply your trade. Merchant. You traded goods from all over the world, pairing items with buyers of all kinds. Drifter. You never quite fit in no matter where you go. Each new town is just a place to rest briefly before moving on to the next. You are more comfortable on the road, traveling the world. Hunter. You live for the thrill of the chase. Whether for glory or for sustenance, you have made your living taking the lives of wild creatures. Mercenary. Blade and battle is your way of life. You solve your problems by pulling out your weapon and applying force. Scientist. The rules that govern the world are a set of alchemical formulae to you, waiting to be discovered and manipulated. I kind of like the idea of her being kind of like... Yes, she's a paladin and a warrior, and she stands up for the downtrodden and everything, but also having like kind of a curious scientific intellectual mind. Plus, I also like the bonus to lore and mechanics, so I think I am going to make her a scientist. And here's where <laughs> um, you can choose the appearance. There's not a whole lot of options. This is an isometric you know, CRPG. It was funded on Kickstarter, and it uses... I think the Unity engine, so there's, it's not going to be like Skyrim or whatever, but it's still really neat. So, I think I like those primary colors. I think I'm going to keep them the same. And um, the, these colors are basically what determine like how your armor and your weapons look. So obviously she can't have facial hair. So basically I just get to choose the head. I can't choose hair because she's a godlike. So there's three heads I can choose from, and then I can choose a portrait for her. 
So I just basically pick the head that I like the most. That's really pretty. I think I'm going to go with this head. I like how shiny she is. <laughs> so I'm going to choose. So they give you a couple of options for the different races and backgrounds that you can pick. So that's obviously a death godlike. So we're not going to choose death godlike. That looks like the uh, animal type godlike or whatever it was called. Fire godlike. Here's the moon godlike, so I could choose this one because it matches her appearance. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with that one. So this will be her portrait throughout the game. And then you can choose the voice that she uses during combat. Eh? I've got this. Let's go. Steady does it. Mm-hmm. Watch and learn. Kill them all! Keeping an eye out. I'm here, leading the way. Ha! Sharp eyes and keen ears. Hmm? I'll lead the way! Death to our enemies! Shh. I'm here. I'm flattered. I think I'm gonna go with Mystic. Finish them! Silence surrounds me. Oh, and now I have to give her a name. <laughs> For some reason, I didn't even think of this before starting the video, and I'm really bad at coming up with names off the top of my head. So, hmm, what name am I going to give her? Hmm, it's a good question. My last character, I called her Alia, so I'm not going to go with Alia, I just used it. Moon. She's a moon godlike. Would it be too obvious to use something like Luna or Celine? I mean, that's really cheesy, but <laughs> it works, right? I mean, maybe that's what her parents picked when she was born. She comes out and she's like, oh my god, she like looks like the moon. We're gonna call her Celine, so let's just go with Celine. And that was character creation. That will be it for this video right now.